good morning. We continue on page 239 from Inside of a Dog. And in these cases, they were also essential for the survival of the person whose life was at risk. So, are the dogs true heroes? They are. But did they know what they were doing? There is no evidence that they did. And they don't know they're acting heroically. Dogs certainly have the potential, with training, to be rescuers. Even the untrained dog may come to your aid. But without knowing exactly what to do, their success is due instead to what they do know. That something has happened to you, which makes them anxious. If they express their anxiety in a way that attracts other people, people with an understanding of emergencies to the scene or allows you leverage out of a hole in the ice, great. This conclusion is affirmed by one clever experiment performed by psychologists interested in whether dogs show appropriate behavior when there is an emergency. In this test, owners conspired with the researchers to feign emergencies in the presence of their dogs in order to see how their dogs responded. In one scenario, owners were trained to fake a heart attack, complete with gasping, a clutch of the chest, and a dramatic collapse. In the second scenario, owners yelped as a bookcase made of particle board descended on them and seemed to pin them to the ground. In both cases, the owner's dogs were present and the dogs had been introduced to a bystander nearby, perhaps a good person to inform if there has been an emergency. In these contrived setups, the dogs acted with interest and devotion, but not as though there were an emergency. Dogs frequently approached their owners and sometimes pawed or nuzzled these seeming victims. Now silent and unresponsive in the heart attack case or crying out for help in the bookcase scenario. Other dogs, though, took the opportunity to roam around in the vicinity, wandering and sniffing the grass or the floor of the room. In only a very few cases did a dog vocalize which might serve to get someone's attention or approach the bystander who might be able to help. The only dog who touched the bystander was a toy poodle. The poodle leaped into the bystander's lap and settled down for a nap. In other words, not a single dog did anything that remotely helped their owners out of their predicaments. The conclusion one has to take from this is the dogs simply do not naturally recognize or react to an emergency situation, one that could lead to danger or death. A killjoy conclusion, hardly. If dogs lack the concepts emergency and death, this is not to their discredit. One might as well ask a dog if he understands bicycles and mousetraps, and then censure him for responding with a puzzled tilt of the head. A human child is also naive to these concepts. An infant has to be screamed at as he zeroes in on an open electrical outlet. A two-year-old who saw someone hurt would likely do little but cry. They will be taught to understand emergency situations and then the concept of death. So too are some dogs trained, for instance, to alert a deaf companion to the sound of an emergency device, such as a smoke alarm. The teaching of children is explicit, with some procedural elements. If you hear this alarm, get mommy. The dog's training is entirely reinforced procedure. What the dogs seem to know is when an unusual situation occurs, they are masters of identifying the usual in the world you share with them. You often act in reliable ways, 
in your own home, you move from room to room, spending long pauses in armchairs and in front of refrigerators. You talk to them. You talk to other people. You eat, sleep, disappear for long stretches into the bathroom, and so on. The environment is fairly reliable too. It is neither too hot nor too cold. There is no person in the house apart from the ones who have come in the front door. Water is not pooling in the living room. Smoke is not drifting in the hallway. From the knowledge of the usual world comes some acknowledgement of the unusual fact of someone's odd behavior when injured or of the dog's own inability to act as though as they customarily can. More than once, Pumpernickel got herself in dire straits. Once trapped on a catwalk, heading off a building edge. Another time, her leash stuck in the elevator doors as the car began to move. I was amazed at how unfazed she appeared, especially as contrasted with my own alarm. It was never she who got herself out of the fix. I believe that I was more worried about her well-being than she was about mine. Still, much of my well-being hinged on her, not on her knowing how to fix dilemmas, great or small, in my life, but rather on her unremitting cheer and constant companionship. Roman numero two. What it is like. In our attempt to get inside of a dog, we gather small facts about their sensory capacities and build large inferences upon them. One inference is to the experience of the dog, what it actually feels like to be a dog, what his experience of the world is. This assumes, of course, that the world is like anything to a dog. Perhaps surprisingly, in philosophical and scientific circles, there is a bit of debate about this. 35 years ago, the philosopher Thomas Nagel began a long running conversation in science and philosophy about the subjective experience of animals when he asked, what is it like to be a bat? He chose for his thought experiment an animal who whose almost unimaginable way of seeing had only recently been discovered. Echo location. The process of emitting high frequency shouts and then listening for the sound being reflected back. How long the sound takes to bounce back and how it is changed gives the bat a map of where all the objects are in the local environment. To get a rough sense of what this might be like, imagine laying in a dark room at night and wondering if someone is standing in your doorway. Sure, you could resolve the question by turning on the light. Or, bat-like, you could hurdle a tennis ball at the doorway and see if A, the ball comes back towards you or flies out of the room, B, if a grunt is heard at about the time the ball arrives at the threshold, if you're very good, you might also use C, how far the ball bounces back to determine if the person is very tubby, in which case the ball loses most of its speed in his belly or has washboard abs, which would reflect the ball nicely. Bats use A and C, and in lieu of tennis balls, they use sound, and they do it constantly and rapidly as quickly as we open our eyes and take in the visual scene in front of us. This appropriately boggled Nagel's mind. He thought that the bat's vision and thus the bat's life are so wildly odd, so imponderable, that it is impossible to know what it is like to be a bat. He assumed that the bat experiences the world. He assumed that the bat experiences the world but he believed that the experience is fundamentally subjective. Whatever it is like, it is that way only to the bat. Trouble with his conclusion has to do with the imaginative leap that we do make every day. Nagel treated 
and interspecies difference as something wholly unlike an intraspecies difference. But we are perfectly happy to talk about what it is like to be another human being. I do not know the particulars of another person's experience, but I know enough about the feeling of being human myself that I can draw an analogy from my own experience to someone else's. I can imagine what the world is like to him by extrapolating from my own perception and transplanting it with him at its center. The more information I have about that person, physically, his life story, his behavior, the better my drawn analogy will be. So we can do this with dogs. The more information we have, the better the drawing will be. To this point, we have physical information about their nervous systems, their sensory systems, historical knowledge, their involuntary heritage, their developmental path from birth to adults, and a growing corpus of work about their behavior. In sum, we have a sketch of the dog Umwelt. The parcel of scientific facts we have collected allows us to take an informed, imaginative leap inside of a dog to see what it is like to be a dog, what the world is like from a dog's point of view. We have already seen that it is smelly, that it is well peopled with people. On further consideration, we can add it is close to the ground. It is lickable. It either fits in the mouth or it doesn't. It is in the moment. It is full of details, fleeting and fast. It is written all over their faces. It is probably nothing like what it is like to be us. It is close to the ground. One of the most conspicuous features of the dog is one of the most conspicuously overlooked when contemplating their view of the world, their height. If you think that there is little difference between the world at the height of an average upright human and that at the height of an average upright dog, one to two feet, you are in for a surprise. Even putting aside for a moment the difference in sound and smell close to the ground, being at a different height has profound consequences. Few dogs are human height, they are human knee height. One might even say they are often underfoot. We are magnificently obtuse when it comes to imagining even the simple fact of their being less than half our height. Intellectually, we know that dogs are not at our height, yet we set up interactions such that the height difference is a constant problem. We put things out of reach dogs, only to be frustrated by their attempts to get them. Even knowing that dogs like greeting us at eye level, we typically do not bend down, or bending down just far enough to allow them to reach our faces with a leap. We may get annoyed when they then leap. Jumping up is the direct result of desiring to get to something one needs to jump up to reach. Scolding, enough for jumping up, dogs happily find there is plenty of interest underfoot. There are, for instance, lots of feet, smelly feet. The foot is a good source of our signature odors. We tend to sweat, pedal, pedally, P-E-D-A-L-L-Y, when we are mentally taxed, stressed, or concentrating hard. Clumsy feet, sitting, we dangle them but not with dexterity. They act as single units with toes only existing in places between which odors may be discovered by a roving tongue. If the foot smells so interesting, of course, then the way we treat them must be awfully frustrating. Damn shoes. We cloister our odors. On the other hand, shoes left behind smell just like the person who had been in them, and they have the additional interest of carrying on their souls 
whatever you squishily stepped in outside. Socks are equally good carriers, carriers of our odor, hence the gaping holes that regularly appear in socks left bedside. On examination, each hole has been lovingly poked by the incisors of a dog with a sock in her mouth. Besides feet, at dog height, the world is full of long skirts and trouser legs dancing with every footfall of the winter, of the wearer. The tight whirling motions, the warp of a pant leg presents to a dog's eye must be tantalizing. Between their sensitivity to motion and their investigatory mouths, it is no wonder one can find one's pants being nipped by the dog at the end of your leash. The world closer to the ground is a more odiferous one, for smells loiter and fester in the ground, while they distribute and disperse in the air. Sound travels differently along the ground, too. Hence, birds sing at tree height, while ground dwellers tend to use the earth to communicate mechanically. The vibration of a fan on the floor might perturb a dog nearby. Likewise, loud sounds bounce more loudly off the floor into resting dog ears. The artist Janice Sturback tried to capture a dog's eye view by rigging a video camera to a girdle worn by Stanley, her Jack Russell Terrier, and recording his preambulations along a frozen river and through Venice, the city of dogs pun probably intended. The result is a manic jumbled rush of sights. The world's a kilter and the image never calm. At 14 inches above the ground, Stanley, Stanley's visual world is a glimpse of his olfactory world. What catches his olfactory interest, he pursues in body and sight. But by suiting up animals with critter cams, we are mostly getting an idea of their vantage on the world, not their entire umwelt. If most, if not all wild animals, only being taken such a vantage, only by taking such a vantage, may we have any information about their world, their day. We can't keep up with a diving penguin as a camera strapped to its back can. Only an inconspicuous camera could capture the tunnel building of a naked mole rat underground. To watch Stanley from the vantage of his back is to be surprised at the view. There is a temptation, though, to think that by capturing a picture of Stanley's day, we have completed the imaginative exercise. It is but the beginning. Thank you for listening. I appreciate you.